there's only so much time in the day. So even if you spend 100% of your waking minutes thinking and working on performance, you're not going to perfect your graph. Yeah. You know, you, what you got to focus on, what we realized we had to focus on were the things that we were doing the worst at. Like, hey, all the things is a pass. All right, so um, before we get started, this is the uh, new studio. So, uh, Scott, before I introduce you, you're, you're my first guest uh, in this little room. I mean, a lot of stuff people can't see off camera, but you said it's a nice little studio. So this will be it going forward. Hopefully I can get people to come in. I'll still set it up if I have to do remote TV and stuff. So, Scott, thanks for coming on. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, uh, thanks for uh, dressing up for the occasion. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. Like I said, you know, I, I'm always working. And it seems like no matter what I'm doing, it's something dirty, and I need yeah. a rag. Yeah. And I just used my T-shirt for a rag, and my wife makes fun of me because I wear my rags yeah. every day. And uh, I hope I'm not embarrassing to uh, you or, or the audience. <laughs> no, no, you're you're good. It's funny you mentioned that I was at Lowe's because um, you know, you saw the rest of the house. It's, you know, it's being remodeled, and uh, you know, we you get people go into Lowe's and they see somebody and they're uh, you know, kind of wearing. You know, just whatever, and you're like, man, this guy looks like a hobo in a sense. But in reality, he's like, look, I'm going to be working, getting dirty all day. What's the point? Right. And yeah. I learned that going to this house, I'll be dusty from doing something. I'll just go right to Lowe's. I'm like, I'm those guys now. <laughs> right. Yeah, there's no shame in, in keeping it real. You yeah. Know? It's like life is dirty, and you get dirty. and Yeah. You know, and there used to be a saying, image is everything. Right. And I, I don't I don't think so so much. You yeah. know, I think you should just be real. Yeah. And um you know, if, if people either like you for what you are or they won't. Yeah, uh when I was younger I felt like I would wear a polo or dress up for the the dumbest things and just for impression. And now older I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> like it took me I just realized not too long ago, I'll go out and wear sweatpants to the store. For me, the longest time, it was like, you're wearing jeans. I was kind of raised like, hey, you're leaving the house. You're leaving the house with an appearance. Just like, just, you know, whatever. And now I'm just like, I don't care anymore. <laughs> yeah, like when I was younger, uh, my dad would wear the most hideous things. And I'd be embarrassed, you know. It's like he'd wear two different colored socks and, and uh, you know, those uh, socks that pull up real high with the stripes on them. And, and um uh, black tennis shoes and just crazy stuff and but now it's like i think my dad was cool it's like yeah. he was comfortable with himself yeah and and i think that's cool so i have a different definition of cool right as a 56 year old man as i did as a 15 year old kid you right know? Uh, yeah for sure it's funny uh another thing is I pe people think think like you know, how did our parents do it? Things are so expensive now. And in reality, they are. But I felt our parents were like, we don't really care about a paint appearance. We just want our family to, you know, survive. We don't care about going down the store and dressing up. And I feel like now it's kind of like flip-flopped. If I'm leaving, everything has to be glamorous. I'm with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, so that's what I think. Like, people are like, oh, I can't afford any of this. Well, do you really need it? And I get, we all get kind of carried away at some point, you know, but I feel like sometimes people like they need everything. They need to have material things once a week, something new. Right. Yeah. To, to me, it's just, it's sad. You know, the, the whole thing about keeping up with the Joneses, y you know, um, I, I disagree. Yeah, I, I really do. I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's wasteful. And and who are you trying to impress? You know, right. people that you don't even know. Right. It 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 really. The more I think about it, the less it makes sense, and I've become um, uh, in opposition to yeah. that line of thinking. And and I guess I use my appearance as my tool to spread my message. Yeah. Of uh, keeping it real. So. There you go. I'm a uh, I'm a weirdo. No 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 no. <laughs> no. Uh, well, once again, thanks for coming on, making the time. Um, I truly appreciate it. Can I get, go over some of your accolades? Yeah. <laughs> so five-time GNCC titles, 
46 overall wins, uh, four hair scramble national championships, and three gold medals. Do you every now and then just kind of like, man, that that that's quite like, like do you think about it? Well, I I feel very blessed, you know, that I I led that life that allowed me to to have those accomplishments, you yeah. know, and um, you know the the more I think about it. Um, the more I realize um, how fortunate I was. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I wrote my Hall of Fame speech a few years back, and at that time, reflecting back on my career, I really came to the conclusion that, that I had been very lucky, um, an extraordinary amount of luck, um, in that my father was very intelligent. He was an inventor. Uh, my mother was a people person. Um, she was a star at Delta Airlines um, for her abilities to uh, handle situations professionally, you mm-hmm. know, and just be an incredible communicator. And and my dad was one of these people that was like a mad scientist. Like, he loved a problem. And uh, he had several patents on things that he developed um, in, in different industries when I was growing up. So he was the kind of guy that I could always come to and get a very intelligent answer to any question. So I was grow, I was raised in this environment that was very special. Yeah. And, and at the time when I was younger, I didn't realize it. Um, my parents weren't wealthy, but uh, they, they made enough money where I could do something that could be looked at as very expensive, you know. Yeah. Um, they loved me and trusted me to do something that people a lot of people would say that's really dangerous how could your parents you know yeah let let you be exposed to that stuff um i lived on a piece of property that 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 they bought when i was 15 that was amazing you know like the the terrain it was such that it was the the perfect training ground you know for a, a kid like me to learn to learn stuff um, there were so many things that fell into place perfectly that I, when I did my speech, I was like, I'm, I'm extremely, extraordinarily lucky. Yeah. But then in the past couple of years, I looked back and reflected on, on that. And I said, no, no, I wasn't lucky. I, I was blessed. You yeah. know, it's like these things happened for a reason. Yeah. And, um, and now I, I have a different perspective. You know, it's like there, there's been a lot of things happen to me that uh, were like miracles. And at the time, I thought, well, these were just coincidences, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, one day, my wife and I were on a pontoon boat in the Ohio River. And uh, I did something stupid, like I ran the boat out of gas. <laughs> and we're in the middle of the river. And, and anybody that lives in this area knows that the barges come and go almost constantly yeah and they're big and wide and they take up a lot of the river and they come right down the middle well that's where we were we were right in the middle and it was a dead calm day and uh i i started to panic i'm like what are we gonna do we are in harm's way and all of a sudden this breeze that it was a really strong wind just blew the boat over and I'm not talking about just blew it over there. Yeah. It blew it over there with so much force that the boat went up on the bank. Dang. And then it went dead calm again, and it was dead calm the whole rest of the day. And I've looked back on that, and I thought, that wasn't a coincidence. That was a gift from God. You yeah. know, it's like, yeah. and I've had a lot of those things happen to me, and it, and it wasn't until I got older and um, kind of had a spiritual awakening uh, and I realized, hey, man, there, there's a lot more to this life thing than we give credit for. For sure. Um, and, and, and now I, I'm a big fan of, of the Bible. You know, there, there's Bible verses that are just so inspiring and motivational. And it's like that thing is a, it's like a rule book on how to be a, a good human being. Mm-hmm. And um, as I've gotten older, uh, I just have a completely different perspective um, about stuff like that, and, and, and I'm a student of it, but but I'm definitely flawed, you know. It's like yeah. I know that I didn't deserve all these wonderful things that have happened to me, you know. I, I've made a lot of mistakes. I've mistreated people. Uh, I've been selfish, um, but but I'm, I'm trying to do better, Yeah. you know. 
Yeah, I agree. Same here uh, to this actual studio in this house. I was looking for six months, and um, uh, looking back on the houses I looked at, there wasn't this bonus room. You know, when I bought this house, there was a tanning bed in here. And it was like a tanning room. So when I look back, now that I look back, I'm like, this house was kind of meant for me, and probably God put that in place for me. And it was kind of funny, uh, as I was looking in that time period, I was just like, I'm never going to find a place. Um, and I was, you know, my realtor's like, just be patient. I'm just like, the market's dry. And I'm just like, you know, kind of praying by my bedside, like, you know, show me a sign or whatever. And finally it came and I'm just like, this was, this was kind of feels like, you know, meant to be with this podcast in this room. Um, and then everything about it just feels like it was kind of right. That's that's so cool. I love hearing stories like that. I yeah. mean, the magic is all around us, you know. Right. Um, it, it's it's fascinating. I'm I'm a, uh, uh, I'm excited to to know more about, like, I, like I'm a student of everything that happens to me now. You mm -hmm. know, it's like, I run into somebody in the elevator and and uh, overhear a conversation and and I ask myself these questions like, okay, why was I exposed to that? What was the lesson in that for me? You know, it, it's like the more I think about it, the more I become a student of everything around me. And I, I really am one of those people who believes absolutely everything happens for a reason. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't used to think that way at all. You know, right. I thought we were just random people doing random things. And, and um, but but there's some magic to it. Yeah. I, I believe that also with like people that come into your life, not just like things, but like certain people come into your life at certain times. Maybe, you know, I've had troubling times and then someone, you're not going to like really see it face to face as in like, you're not going to just know why they came into your life for that reason. But then you look back, you're like, they came in there when I needed them most. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, I think that's, that's cool too. Cause like, there's definitely people that have come to my life different times period where I was like, what, for any reason, I'm just like, man, I think God put that person in my life. Yeah. I mean, I feel that way about my wife. Yeah. You know, it's like. I did some regrettable stuff when I was younger. And, and like I said before, I, I was selfish. And, and my wife is, is like a saint, you know? It's yeah. like she's a caregiver for her brother and her mom and dad. And she just does for everybody around her uh, all the time. And, and that has been so uh, inspiring to me, mm -hmm. you know? Because for a lot of my life, I was all about me, you know, and I had people around me that were all about me, too. So there were people working on, on my bikes and people driving me to the races and people making sure that I was eating the right stuff and that my yeah. suspension was right. And, uh, man, my wife is just completely opposite of the way I was. Yeah. She's one of those people that's taking care of her people. And... Uh, I think, man, did I have it wrong? And what, what kind of a jerk was I? To, yeah. uh, uh, and I had friends that were wonderful friends that, that would come to races with me and forego time with their own families yeah. uh, to, to help pull me out of a mud hole in West Virginia somewhere on a hot, muggy day. Yeah. And, and I think back on, you know, wow, what kind of friends did I have? You know, yeah. it's like... They deserve so much of the credit for for me winning trophies and championships and having sponsors and having this wonderful life. Yeah. You know, as I've become older, I have more and more of an appreciation for that whole environment. And, um, uh, gosh, it's, uh, it's, it's really kind of like a dream. Sometimes I think about my, la my, my past life, and uh, it, it's, it's, it's just amazing. The things that I experienced – the excitement, the adrenaline, um, uh, the opportunity, um, the fun. You know, yeah. like when you're a 29-year-old man, there's not much more exciting than uh, swinging your leg over a 50-horsepower machine yeah. and making and ringing that thing out for all it's worth and going as fast as it'll possibly go between two trees that may be 18 inches in <laughs> diameter at 60 miles an hour yeah where if you make a mistake you can die right when you're 29 that's awesome that's yeah. exciting yeah you know yeah but yeah i think like what you said you know you were selfish and then you know like you didn't know until maybe god brought your your wife in they're like hey um maybe appreciate things better 
Absolutely. Yeah, I, I totally think that I met her for a reason, and, and her purpose uh, was to teach me, you mm -hmm. know. And and uh, and I love her, and, and she loves me, and 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 life is life is is very very cool. And yeah. So fun. Uh, do you think though? Uh, you know, you said you know you were very selfish, but I think part of that is you have to be that way at a young age to get where you were. Um, I think if you were um, just be like, oh yeah, let's let's go to the movies, let's do this. You may not have the success you have instead of your drive, your focus to be where you were. I think you're right. I mean, uh, I think there is a lot of ego involved. You right. know, like I remember um, something happened at a Florida race um, years ago, and um, one of my main competitors in the four-stroke class uh, started in the wrong row accidentally mm -hmm. so he started maybe let's say three or four minutes before i did and uh florida's brutal you know sand whoops very physical very difficult for for three hours and uh, i felt like i rode the race of my life that day well this this other my competitor had a several minute head start so i had to go through several hundred guys that he didn't go through um so the, the on that day the playing field wasn't even. Mm -hmm. He had a huge advantage, and I came within a couple seconds of beating him, but he, he beat me. But in my mind, I won that race yeah. because of what I went through. And um, I talked to the promoter, and uh, my dad and I kind of explained our position, like, how, how was this fair? How, how can Scott not be the champion of this race today? And um, some guy I don't know came over, and he said, listen, son he said you're you're not half the rider that that guy is he said you you need to shut your mouth and um you need to go home and and uh and cope with the fact that you got your ass kicked today you know and boy me and my dad were just so uh frustrated mm -hmm. you know like at that time we wanted respect and and winning races was how you earned respect and in our mind i won that race that day but i was dealt a bad hand yeah you know and but the cool thing about this is is that motivated me that guy did something for me it was a gift mm -hmm. um, because from that time forward um i was driven like i was determined to become somebody uh, somebody special that he would remember. Uh, I was determined to prove him wrong. Yeah. And that was a gift. At the time, right? At the yeah. time, it's, it seemed like a terrible thing. And uh, my feelings were hurt. And uh, I was angry, mad. And, uh, but now I look back, and I'm thankful for that guy. I'm thankful for that event. Because me and my dad kind of had a chip on our shoulder from that day forward. And this went on for years. We were determined um, to to win races, to win championships, to to do something that was special. Mm -hmm. and, isn't that funny? Yeah. You know, something right. that was really a negative. You know, it reminds me of my house burning down a few years ago. Um, at the time, it seemed devastating. Um, and I didn't have insurance. So I lost, like, we lost like $300,000 that day. And, and, I, and we had the house paid for it. Uh, so financially, that was uh, hard. That mm -hmm. was a big blow. But then in the, in the days after that, um, my brother-in-law got a brain injury. And he needed my wife and I to kind of move in with him to, to help him, to assist him with his daily stuff. And, you know, had we had that house still, I would have maybe resented having to do that. Because yeah. I would have had to leave that beautiful house um, to go do something that I knew was morally the right thing. Mm -hmm. But it's like God took that house and, and he modified the equation, Yeah, you know, uh, for me. And that was a beautiful gift because now uh, uh, I recognize that, that it, it all happened for a reason. Yeah. It's like the puzzle pieces were, were being put in place and... Um, and it, and it made me less materialistic, right. you know, like I'm not connected to stuff the way I used to be. Uh, yeah, I, I have uh, uh, some cool jet skis and a bunch of trophies and uh, 
a pool table and you know I, I had a lot of cool stuff but in the end what I learned was that the, the stuff's not important you know yeah. it's the people in your life um, uh, it's so cool and, and, and isn't that crazy I know that it, it was like my wife and I were in tears um, we went to get cell phones the next morning and some song came on the radio and, and we just supposed to start crying uh, so it was it was it was a crazy thing to go through but I look back on it now and I'm thankful for it that's awesome yeah, it is weird how uh, yeah things work out, and I'm glad. Um, that's cool that you saw the other side of it in a way. Some people would be like full panic, or like, I can't take care of this. My house is gone. Like I couldn't. I can't assist with someone else. I gotta focus on this. And you realize, oh, that's where I'm supposed to be. But yeah, I, I've seen people that would be like, I just can't right now. What am I supposed to do with my stuff? And you know, and you realize I gotta I gotta take care of this. This is my priority. He showed me this is where I need to focus on. Yeah, it's uh, pretty cool. Um, so what was it like uh, growing up in the Petersburg area back back then? Well, um, uh, when my parents bought that property, I was probably like 1981. I was like 14, 15 years old. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, I went to Connor High School. And, um, you know, I was one of those kids that uh, – uh, was not really uh, athletic, you know. It's like I didn't. I wanted to fit in with the conventional sports, you know. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I played basketball even in elementary school and was terrible at it, you know. And, and then I started thinking, okay, maybe individual sports are, are more for me because I don't spend so much time on the bench. Um, so I, I did like wrestling and tennis and things that were just all me. Mm-hmm. And. Uh, I'm thankful that I did that because, like, with with wrestling, those guys train. Yeah. You know, like we ran stairs, and uh, uh, and those guys are always trying to meet weight, so they were doing things like wearing a a, a hefty bag, um, and, and, and lifting weights and running and all that stuff, and uh, it taught me a lot about discipline and weightlifting. So I I learned stuff. I was kind of picking up stuff, but I was not athletic at yeah. all. I mean, I was I was. I, when I was a kid, I played t-ball, and I would strike out, you know, and and the ball's right there. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. kind of tells you. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> but but what's funny is uh, as I got you know to be in my maybe early twenties, um, I, I started to to really develop um, fitness and and uh, nutrition and. Uh, take all that stuff seriously that that I never even thought about, you know, when I was younger, and uh, and and gosh, if you knew me in the sixth grade, you know, and you you picked out all the boys in the class, and you say, all right, which one of these boys is most likely to to become a professional athlete in in, in a sport? I wouldn't have been picked, you know. It's <laughs> like I would be the last guy. Yeah, uh, I was shy and backward and. And uh, just just not skilled at all. Like I, I throw the basketball up there, and I miss the whole backboard. You know, like <laughs> a mile away. Yeah. So yeah, it's kind of funny. What year did you get your first bike? How old were you then? Well, I was uh, I was five. Uh, my grandfather, my dad's dad, bought me um, a, a little. It was just a little like a, a Briggs and Stratton in a, in a frame. Mm-hmm. And. Um, he took me in the backyard of his house, and he had a flower bed back there, a circular flower bed. And uh, he had me going in circles around this thing. And he said that, um, you know, my smile on my face got bigger and bigger, and the circles started getting bigger and bigger because <laughs> I was building up speed, but yeah. I hadn't really mastered cornering it. And eventually, like, I built up too much speed. The circles got too big, and I flipped off into the bushes. Um, Dang. And... Um, he he told my grandmother he said well this is this is going to be it you know he's either going to want to get back on that bike real quick and get it fired up or he's going to be done with this yeah. you know and uh of course i was i was fired up to get it back going again and heck yeah and uh my 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 older sister had just the opposite experience you know she, yeah she she fell off and she started crying and she said i don't want anything to do with that thing ever again so that happened to my funny. sister she she rode my xr100 and she's like we're by the garage she dumped the clutch and it just went shooting with her into the garage. 
because I don't want anything to do with that thing again. <laughs> it's funny how little things like that can just change the direction of your life. Yeah. Yeah. What? So was your, so you had this nice piece of property uh, where you're at now, and then, so you went from that little thing. Would you, when did you, like, what were you riding when you first started racing? <sighs> Well, um, I went from that little bike to a Honda MR50. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a little two-cycle. And then I went from that to like an RM80, YZ80. Yeah. Um, uh, did some, some quite a bit of motocross stuff back then. Was never great. You know, I went to the amateur nationals and, um, you know, uh, did just... Uh, well, I'll tell you how I was. I was on motocross track. I was so intimidated by everybody else on the starting line that I would wait till everybody else got in the first turn before I would go. Whoa. Because I was so afraid of getting run over. Really? Yeah. So, um, and my dad was probably looking at me like, that's my boy. You yeah. Know? Uh, he, he had to feel shame. <laughs> Did you like the catch up game, though? Was that like something like, <clears throat> all right, I'm going to catch all these guys? Well, no, because I was so <laughs> slow that I couldn't catch them, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like, my speed didn't develop for uh, probably 15 years later, yeah. you know? Like, I rode, I spent a lot of time riding and racing uh, and, and and was never skilled. And um, uh, somebody said something the other day about how uh, a, a champion is just a loser that refused to give up. Yeah, some, you know, I've heard that. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, you know, and, and that was me. Yeah, you know, I uh, and, and my dad did something really cool. He was not one of those dads that pushed me, you know. Um, he he was like Scott. He's like, this is expensive. It's a lot of work. Um, this is gonna be fun. Oh, we're not gonna do it. Yeah, you know. I, I think maybe I threw a fit had some kind of tantrum about not doing as well as I wanted to one day. And he sat me down and he was like, Hey, uh, this, we're going to have fun and we're not going to do it. So let's, let's make that our focus. And, and that kind of allowed me to regroup. And, um, because of that attitude, uh, we always kept it fun because it was fun. I did it a lot, you know, and that was the, that was the key to paradise. I, I did it so much that eventually I figured it out. Yeah. You know, and, and, uh, uh, kind of rode and raced myself into contention, and it, but it took years. Luckily, yeah. I started at a young enough age where, you know, my body was was um, it wasn't too late. Yeah. You know, like uh, I remember hearing sometime that the male body physically peaks at like 28, 29. Oh, really? I, at least if, if I'm right, that, yeah. that may have changed yeah. now. Maybe it's 23. I don't know. Um, but I started early enough where uh my body was still getting stronger you know my my stamina was still building and um another thing i think about a lot is the guys i was racing against it was like i was racing against a lot of wealthy dads kids because it's an expensive sport you know like you think of like uh kevin hines and randy hawkins and and ty davis and yeah uh, uh guy cooper and um, uh, Scott Plessinger, you know, like my rivals were, were, were lucky kids too. Yeah. You know, like the, there, there might've been some inner city kids that could have kicked all of our butts, <laughs> you know, but they yeah. were never given the opportunity. Right. Because times are, times are hard. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when, like as you're racing, did you realize I need to actually like, train train for some of these races well uh you know at the six days um those events were really um about speed because you you'd ride the dirt bike for seven or eight hours a day but you'd have these special tests that were short uh maybe a mile or two and you'd be timed in these special tests and even when I was very competitive at the GNCCs where I could win overall, mm-hmm. uh, sometimes fairly easily, I'd go to these six days events and just get smoked. And what I realized was that my speed wasn't that great. This raw speed, when it came time to, um, to sprint, I didn't have it, you know, and, and it, it got proven to me every time I, I went to the six days. Um, so uh, what I realized was that I had to come up with a different plan if I was going to 
win, and that was fitness. Yeah. You know, so even though I didn't have the sprint speed, as long as I could wear everybody out, I could have a career doing this. Yeah, I I read a quote that you said is if GNTC was an hour, I wouldn't have anything, but now that it's three hours, I just I can stay consistent. Yeah, yeah, like uh, um, I I I realized that. Well, my dad and I had a lot of time to thank on these drives home Mm -hmm. from (laughs) these places all over the country, hours and hours, and uh, and my wife makes fun of me even today. Uh, that I don't listen to the radio. You know, I, I like quiet time to think through problems and try to solve them. Same here. And, and my dad and I would spend hours and hours on end trying to think about what our limiting factors had been that day. Mm-hmm. So let's say uh, I lost a race by a minute. Well, you have all these different uh, aspects of your race program, right? Um, there's your suspension. And there's what you eat. Right. And there's what you drink. Were you hydrated enough? You know, there's your, um, your, your handlebars and there's your power character. And I could go on for hours. Yeah. You know, there's your skills in the mud. There's your cornering skills. There's your jumping skills. Um, we could talk about just that for days. But if you graph every rider, it's like, okay, they're good in this category. They're bad in that category. And everybody has these different graphs. But at the end of the day, um, it is whoever did the best. When you average all those things out over a three-hour race, uh, that's who's there. Yeah. Um, so, and, and the thing about it is there's only so much time in the day. So even if you spend 100% of your waking minutes thinking and working on performance, you're not going to perfect your graph. Yeah. You know, you, what you got to focus on, what we realized we had to focus on were the things that we were doing the worst at. So uh, one of the things we realized was that I was riding the heaviest bike uh, out there. Yeah. And in a mud race, uh, we may be collecting 50 additional pounds. Uh, at Carlsbad one day, I collected 86 pounds of additional oh weight on a bike that already weighed 300. And uh, I crashed during this race. and. I could hardly pick up my bike. Like, it took everything I had. It was like I was picking up a gold wing yeah. out there on a motocross track. And um, uh, so we thought about, okay, we got to keep this bike from accumulating all this weight. And we came up with all these ideas, basically weight savings measures, uh, putting foam all around the engine. Uh, we developed these things called fender skins. And I, re- I realized that my jersey would always flop in the breeze and the dirt would fall off of it. And... Uh, I was like, man, we need to put this th- this fabric on the whole bike so that it doesn't accumulate weight. Um, and, and it worked, and we did it. Um, so just just crazy stuff, you know. Like we were always trying to make our graph uh, better. Um, and, and ultimately, I think it all comes down to time management, you know, yeah. and, and focus and desire and uh, who's willing to, to spend – who's willing to uh, – spend that much time uh getting better yeah yeah i think uh going back you said your dad was kind of like a a scientist in a way and the way you're talking it sounded like you know he kind of was like brainstorming so much about this versus like you know you see many moto dads whatever they're like man i guess he just wasn't good today we'll just try it again next week your dad I, i i just picture this you know picture him like being in the basement or something like how can we get faster and just instead of him just riding? Where can we start shaving stuff? And that that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's like he had a, he, a the mind of an inventor. Yeah, you know, um, and and uh, it's it's fascinating how these guys come up with these ideas. Uh, you you look at different industries and and everybody's solving different problems. Mm-hmm. And um, he developed a machine that removed. Uh, sand and dirt from tobacco leaves Ah. Um, you know the the equipment was expensive and they're trying to churn out a lot of cigarettes and they don't want the machines to wear out they don't want people to be smoking dirt and sand and have that in their mouth Mm -hmm. yeah so uh, yeah he he did these these cool things Um, and and so it's almost like he had training that made him the perfect tool for my toolbox you know as I'm uh, developing problems. Guess what? My dad's the ultimate problem solver. Yeah. How lucky, 
how blessed <laughs> was I? Right. What um, what you do? And so the winners around here it can be relatively, I guess, I'm not gonna say brutal, but they can last forever and just be cold. How would you train? You know, because the GNCCs are coming spring and all the way to fall. How would you tr- how would you train the winter time? Well, we uh, we would always uh, stick around until the uh, Indy trade show, um, and then as soon as that was over with, we'd head to Florida. Okay. And uh, spend several weeks down there, and that was good for a couple reasons. Number one, like you said, the climate is, mm-hmm. is great. Uh, but then the, the the sand whoops were just so physical. Man, that was a good workout to yeah. prepare for the season. Yeah. And the opener typically was in Florida. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah. That, that's that's what we did and uh and and once again you know who that was i was blessed you know that we could afford to just um head out yeah and, and live somewhere else for a while you know it's expensive and yeah uh, there's complications with being away from home you know having a place to work on your bikes and, yeah how how far in your career did honda like notice you and then they're like hey we, we want to get behind you or or let me let me back that <clears> up a second was your first bike when you started racing? Was it a Honda? Um, yes, um, I used to race local motocrosses at Pendleton County, and um, I I rode CR. Well, okay, my first real bike that I learned how to ride on was an XR two hundred. Okay, that was a Christmas gift from my mom and dad. Yeah, I have that in my notes. <laughs> and, and they got my sister an XR eighty, and they got me an XR two hundred. Yeah, and. Uh, that's another thing that was fascinating that the xr200 is kind of known for the perfect bike to teach a person how to ride efficiently Mm -hmm. because it doesn't have a lot of power right uh you have to carry a lot of corner speed um if you want to go at any kind of pace whatsoever and uh so it was like the perfect training bike and the power character was very user friendly um, I had always ridden two strokes up to that point and, and was never really a master of the clutch. Mm-hmm. And as soon as I started riding that XR200, I was like, whoa, wait a minute. This, this power character doesn't require me to use the clutch. You know, I can do everything with the throttle. Yeah. Um, uh, and that's really where I developed uh, the understanding of the control of the bike. Yeah. Uh, putting my weight in the right spot so that I'm giving the tires every opportunity to get traction, saving energy um, because the power character was so smooth and user-friendly. Um, I, I really, um, in 1982, uh, with an XR200, that's when I understood it all. I mm-hmm. got it. And, and I rode the tires off that bike around the farm in Petersburg. Yeah. But I got to a point one day where I was like, okay, uh, I'm getting beat because I need more power. Um, so I went from an XR200 to a CR500, and that is night and day. Two-stroke, back to two-stroke, two stroke. yeah. And, and that th- those bikes are just rocket ships. Yeah. And uh, so then I went from one extreme to the other, way too far. Yeah. And, and uh, it took me a little while. Eventually, we took a stopwatch to the track, and um, in 1985, the first XR600 came out. And uh, my grandpa... Uh, my dad's dad bought me that bike as a graduation gift. I graduated high school in 85. And uh, that's where uh, that's where the real magic happened because the XR600 was just like the 200 as far as, you know, user friendliness. Mm-hmm. But it just had all the power that I needed um, to, to go fast enough to beat guys on a 252 stroke. Yeah. Um, and, and it was really against conventional wisdom, you know. Like a lot of people made fun of me for riding that bike, you know. And they said, "Hey, Scott, you could do so much better if you would just ride a real bike," and, meaning a 252 stroke. Yeah. Uh, but but my dad and I kind of uh, we disagreed. Yeah. You know, it's like, and even to this day, um, there are things about a heavy motorcycle that are good. Right. Um, like straight line stability. Um, those knobbies underneath my bike were working harder to get me traction than those guys' bikes that were 50 pounds lighter, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and my power character um, was so good. Uh, once again, my tires were advantaged 
because of the weight and the power character of my bike. And a lot of people, even to this day, they, they don't recognize it. They don't accept it. They say, oh, you got to have a, uh, a light bike. Uh, and I still disagree. Um, and, and maybe I'm old school, um, but I'm still not convinced um, that, that a guy can't perform extremely well on a, on a heavier bike than he thinks he can. Yeah. Did you try the CR route at all? Did you give it a shot? Yeah, yeah, I did. Uh, back when we were kind of in the uh, trying to figure stuff out stage, um, I we had an XR 600, a CR 250, and a CR 500, mm-hmm. and those were the three bikes that that I would ride. And eventually, we saw, we were like, we got to get the stopwatch out and figure this out. <clears throat> and on a on a dry, slippery, hard packed track, um, uh, I got off the CR 500, and I felt like I just set the world on fire because I was exhausted. You know, it's like I just put in a lap that Jesus Christ would be proud of. Yeah. You know, if he rode. Um, and then I got off the 600 and I like, I was like, I felt, I felt slow. You know, it's like, I felt like everything was in slow motion. I, I didn't feel like I had spent any energy. Um, and, the, and the 250, I was right in between. So by seat of the pants, I thought I was fastest on the CR500. Yeah. But the stopwatch doesn't lie, and I was way faster on the 600, the right. bike that I thought I was the slowest on, and and that's when we sold all the two strokes and we never looked back. Yeah, that's crazy. Was the 400 in, in existence yet? No, the 400 wasn't developed until around I think 96, yeah. something like that. Were you part of that development? Um, um I. I was involved a little bit with some of the marketing materials. Yeah. There was some rumors, you know, that the bike had been developed specifically for me because yeah. I was doing real well on the 600 at that time. But, and I raced it in Japan when it was a very brand new bike. Yeah. Um, but I, I wasn't a fan of it. Like at the end of that, I won the race, but at the end of the race, I was exhausted and, and I felt like uh, I was having to ride it way harder than I, I would have on a 600, you know? Mm-hmm. So I just never took that bike seriously. I'm a pretty big guy. I'm 6'1", 185 pounds, 175 pounds. So I was a little bit big for that frame on that bike. Yeah. Um, and, and there was some features, I think, that um, uh, were just very different. Um, the, the torque, the lug ability of the 600 yeah. was amazing. And um, on the 400, I didn't have that. Yeah. Really, that's interesting. That's do they still make the six hundred? Um, well, they make it kind of because <laughs> they make the XR six fifty L, which yeah. is a street legal version. Yeah, yeah. And that's not a whole lot different from the bike that I raced. Right. Yeah. Um, so, I, uh, Honda picks you up, and then are are you full ride or how does that work out? Well, um, let's see. I was uh, um, getting a little bit of support from Al Baker who was involved in the development of XRs um, back in, like, the 80s. He helped Johnny O'Mara before yeah. before me. And uh, he had a little aftermarket company out in uh, Hesperia, California, where he sold performance XR parts. And uh, I guess he saw my name and some results and invited me to come do the Baja with he and an- another guy. And um, Al was a super cool guy, real laid back and friendly and intelligent mm-hmm. and um, uh, he uh, talked to some folks at Honda and I was given an offer uh, but it wasn't much yeah you know it's like a couple bikes and, and maybe $2,500 parts credit um, but at the time I had my heart set on that bike it's like um, I started getting results and, and the results were just getting better and better and better and, um, you know, a, a couple of years went by, and um, that's when ATK kind of came into the scene, uh, an American-made dirt bike. Mm-hmm. And um, they had some marketing dollars to spend. Uh, Kawasaki uh, was a player in, in, in some contract negotiations for me. Um, uh, KTM was a player. Um, I, I, my results were, went from like national number 11 to number 9 to number 5 to number 3 
and they were all odd numbers, you know, <laughs> and, and and me and my dad or my family and my friends, and we're all kind of doing the math, like, I'm going to do this, you know, yeah. I'm going to be the champion. And, um, and, of course, we wanted to convince all the, uh, uh, all the companies that that was the case, too, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Um, because we were spending, my dad was spending a lot of money keeping us at the races, in the motel rooms, you know, buying the meals and buying the gasoline and you know how it is. So uh, we were at this point where uh, we, as a family, we needed help to, to keep this addiction going, you know, this addiction to performance. Anyway, uh, ATK ended up being the highest bidder. Uh, so I flew out there, and uh, they they built a bike specifically for me to test, and um, <clears throat> and and in the middle of the test, the bike throttle stuck wide open. Oh shit! And uh, I kind of went off this ridge and, and landed on my tailbone real hard and, and didn't break anything, but I was hurt, and uh, they never were able to get the bike fixed. Like eventually they got it running, but then it died and it, they could never get it restarted. And this is the factory, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and, and once again, it was a blessing, right? Yeah. Because, yeah. because they were offering me, let's say, sixty, seventy thousand um, dollars, plus all the bikes and parts I, I could ever want. And to me, at that time, that was a huge sum of money. Yeah. You know, um, when, when Honda was offering me a couple bikes and twenty five hundred dollars parts. Yeah. Um, but because of what happened, it forced me to do something that I believed in. You know. I, I stuck with Honda. Uh, even the KTM offer was better than the Honda. The Honda offer was lower than all the other companies. Um, but we were just hoping and praying that I would become the champion on the Honda, mm-hmm. and then that would give us bargaining power and leverage, and, and then the numbers would change. Right. And that's exactly what happened. And, yeah. and, uh, uh, in 1990, I became the champion of the National Hair Scramble Series and the National and the GNCC was called the 100 Miler Series at that time. Yeah. Um, uh, and it was the first time it had been done on a four-stroke. So, you know, that, that created a lot of buzz. You know, uh, uh, Mark Hyde s- said, you know, Suzuki at that time uh, and a lot of the Suzuki customers didn't realize uh, uh, how capable the DR line of motorcycles was until I started winning on an XR. Yeah. So it, it was like this this thing started to evolve and develop, and I was right in the heart of it. Uh, once again, I was blessed. You know, it's like yeah. it was magic. Yeah. Um, and, and I was right in the middle of it, and, uh, and then the ball just really started rolling. You know, it's like Honda was so cool to me. They were like Scott and Fred, um, who was my friend and business partner and manager and truck driver, you know, at the time. Yeah. Uh, he was brilliant too. Uh, they were like, "Hey, we we appreciate and respect um, the job you guys have done. Uh, here's a budget. Go do more of it." <laughs> so we had all this freedom. Yeah. You know, I could go to the races I wanted to go to, and you know, seek the championships I wanted to seek. And uh, I didn't have the pressure of like a full-on factory sponsorship where they control everything and they make all the decisions. Yeah. So if I wanted to go with um, uh, Works Enduro Rider suspension instead of factory connection, I'm the one that made the call. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. So there's a beauty in that. Yeah. You know, there's a freedom in that that uh, that doesn't exist otherwise. Of course, at the time, I didn't realize it. Yeah. At the time, I wanted a full-on factory effort. You know, I wanted their best mechanics. I wanted their their best titanium parts right out of Japan. You know, I wanted all these things. Um, but looking back, uh, I think I had the best. Yeah. You know, I, I had access to, to all the best experts. In, um, in, in I could choose my own tires. You know, hey, if I like Bridgestone or Pirelli's the best, that's who I could go after. And, uh, and it taught me such a lesson. Uh, a lot of times the companies... Uh, that don't have the best products have the biggest budgets yeah. to hire riders to promote those products. So you can bite yourself. Uh, you can you can harm yourself by getting greedy. Yeah, I mean, I could have made good money on that ATK, but I could have never finished a race and ended my career prematurely, Right. too. Um, so as a racer, 
that's a balancing act that you always have to play. Like, okay, I got to pay the bills, but I got to get results. And uh, and then as as I've gotten older, there's this element of morality um, that maybe I wasn't so thinking about at that time. But when I came home to Kentucky, it sure felt good to tell my best friends, "Hey, man, go buy an XR." Yeah. Because you're going to get the most reliable bike. It's going to be the easiest one to work on. It's going to be durable. It's going to be dependable. It's going to start. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And the price is going to be pretty darn good compared to everything else. So from a moral standpoint, you can be honest. Like when you choose to align yourself with companies that are the best companies, you can you can sleep well at night knowing, hey, I promoted products that were good products. Yeah. I'm so glad that energy drinks didn't exist yeah. back then Yeah. because I would have been put in a spot because I know that stuff's garbage. Yeah, if you, is, ever, if you ever notice the riders on the podium, they're not drinking energy drinks. And if people don't know this, they're on the back side, it'll say water. So it's, it's all like marketing, but in reality, it's all water. Because I've seen a guy even drop it on the podium and it's empty. Right. They know better. <laughs> yeah, they know better. They know better. It's it's garbage. Sugar is poison. Yeah. You know, it's like uh, so many people don't know that. And, and I'm passionate about, um, I feel blessed that I know that now. And, and maybe it's because growing up around combustion engines, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, a Honda, a Suzuki, a Kawasaki, whatever. Those bikes will only live up to their potential if given the proper fuel. Yeah. You know, we all know that, you know, you put a crappy fuel in a bike, it's going to run like crap if it runs at all. Right. Yeah. Well, a human body is the exact same way. If you want to live up to your potential, you certainly don't put sugar in your mouth because that stuff is poison. Yeah. Like 70, I think 70, 80 percent of all health problems are a result of people putting sugar in their mouth. Like cancer and diabetes and a heart disease yeah. and on and on and on and on. And it's, it's such a travesty. You know, we live in like this sugar matrix where almost all of our food choices, there's sugar that sneaks in there. Yeah. You know? Right. But then we all have this high health insurance and, and we're all always sick. I know. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, it's almost like sometimes, not to be conspiracy, but like it's almost like it's it's supposed to happen. Like all right, you're going to eat this, this, and then you go to the doctor. And it's like never, you're, you'll always be on that cycle until you find a way to look in some stuff and break away. Right. And, and I'm not saying that uh, to judge anyone. Yeah. Because um, I'm saying that as a public service announcement because I love people. Yeah. And I want them to thrive. And, and, and I know it's hard, you know, like uh, good whole food is not easy to come by. Yeah. It's not cheap. Um, and it also takes discipline. Yeah. Uh, and and you, we've been trained to, to eat this stuff that's not even food. Yeah, it, I know. It tastes good. Yeah. But you know what? When, when God made food, uh, like an avocado or a walnut, you know, um, or, or, or watermelon, you know, like there's sugar in there, but there's fiber in there too. And that fiber is, is a magical component, yeah. you know, to, to keep your, your levels correct. I saw something recently on uh, social media where this guy said that um, these big corporations, food corporations, have removed fiber from food. So maybe it's for taste, maybe for whatever. So he's like, hey, you, you can take this if you're to eat the crappy food, like pizza, take this fiber. And it was like a liquid. It wasn't like a fiber pill. Take this pre before you take your food. And it kind of, he's like, in a sense, regulates you. But I believe that. I believe that fiber has been probably been taken out. Because look how big we are now as a country. Right. right. It, um, there's a guy named Robert Lustig <clears throat> out in California. And he's been uh, on these task forces to, to make a difference mm -hmm. with regard to the harms of sugar. And um, he was like, you know what? All these children are developing these diseases that, that elderly people uh, used to only get. Right. And it's because... Uh, we're feeding our kids all of this garbage and and we're glorifying it you know what happens at christmas time well we fill your stocking up with candy mm -hmm. you know for your birthday you get a big sugary cake with lots of icing and cupcakes and halloween halloween same thing yeah. 
it's almost like, uh, okay, we we need to go through this some education. Number one, mm-hmm. and, and when you don't know, you don't know. So you're not abusing your children uh, when you don't know about health and diet and nutrition, right. and, and and that sugar is poison. But once you know, uh, wow, it's it's kind of like child abuse because the children are they don't know better right you know they just lead they, they just uh, the example is the adult and uh i think the majority of adults don't know better right um and and it's sad and, and i'm i feel so lucky and blessed and fortunate that i know what the right fuel is i can afford the right fuel i have access to the right fuel and i love myself enough to feed myself in a way that, you know, I look at my body as like a gift from God. Mm-hmm. And, and, and don't I want to treat that thing with respect? Right. You know what I mean? Uh, well, I do. And, and uh, I have a whole different thinking about food now. Yeah. Um, I saw this thing on Facebook the other day. It was uh, a guy uh, was broken down on the side of the road. And um, this, this real wealthy guy pulls up in this uh mercedes or whatever and uh gets out and he's like do you mind if i if i help uh, help you get your car going and the guy was like well sure buddy and, and a few minutes later he gets his hands dirty and he got it running like a top and and all of a sudden this 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 old guy said well what would make a person like you pull over and help a person like me and um the guy was like well well my name's henry ford and this car you're driving, uh, I'm pretty much responsible for its existence. And he said, uh, I don't like to see my cars being broke down on the side of the road. I, I want them to to thrive. Yeah. Uh, I feel like it's a personal responsibility. And, and the point of the post was the guy said, uh, that's the way uh, uh, I think Jesus thinks too. You know, it's like the point was we have a create we have a creator, mm-hmm. um, just like Henry Ford was the creator of that vehicle, and I think he wants us to thrive. You know, yeah. he's probably shedding some tears when we're eating uh, pop tarts <laughs> and, and, and uh, just complete garbage that's not even food. Um, we're so capable. The human body is is like the ultimate machine. Mm-hmm. Like uh, Mr. Honda developed some pretty amazing motorcycles, but they don't heal themselves. Right. Human bodies heal themselves. How how amazing and magnificent is that? Um, That's like uh, I just tore my calf last week going on a run just because it's a long story, but I tore it and uh, I'm like, so I talked to people like, what do I do? Like, uh, I just kind of waited out in my mind. I'm like, okay. I'm like, it will just heal itself. Yeah, it will heal itself. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, think of Mr. Honda figured out a way to do that. Yeah. You know? Right. And maybe they will someday. You know, maybe motorcycles will, will fix themselves. Yeah. Someday. Um, but uh, fuel, fuel is so important, and food is fuel. And I think it was Steve Jobs said, um, let food be your medicine, otherwise medicine will become your food. Yeah. And and man, I look at my peers, you know, I'm in my 50s and 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 people older than me. Man, there's a lot of pill bottles. I know. In the kitchens. And and, and medicine has become people's food. And it's such a shame because I know. because uh I know better. I really do. I know you don't need any of that stuff. Uh the human body is the perfect miracle machine. Yeah. Just feed it right. What was your like off off the bike stuff that you did when you were riding uh, diet and then like training stuff? Well, uh, I I talked to some people. I was hungry for for knowledge about physical performance. Mm-hmm. So back in the day, back in the eighties, there was a guy named Jeff Spencer who was um, kind of a naturopath, chiropractor. Uh, doctor kind of to the stars he worked with like johnny o'mara and rick johnson um all the top guys of the day Mm -hmm. so whenever i would get hurt break my wrist or whatever 
I would call him, and it would cost me like $100 an hour or something to talk to him. Wow. And, but the information he would give me was priceless. You know, like he would tell me about all these supplements and things I could do to oxygenate my blood and um, uh, make sure I got all this nourishment through supplements, whether it be calcium or, or whatever. And I would heal like in half the time that the conventional doctors would tell me. Yeah. You know, so I knew it was working. And, uh, of course, I needed to get back on the bike because every moment that I was injured, um, I, I was losing uh, uh, capabilities to my competitors. I, mean, I, was, I was losing opportunities to learn. Uh, I wasn't training at the, at the same level, so I was hungry to get better faster. So, anyway, I learned a lot through those conversations. And um, uh, I, I realized that your heart is the most important muscle in your body yep. because it oxygenates your blood and that oxygenated blood goes to all the muscles and, and sees that they can do the best they can do. So I started really working on my heart and I think I was the first guy to do that. So I would do stairs and I would run and I, I was really big on jumping rope. Uh, cause I, I like the rhythm of it mm-hmm. and, uh, uh, I could get my heart rate up, and I could work my quadriceps because when you're riding a dirt bike, you need strong triceps, strong quadriceps. Well, you need strong everything, yeah. but your quads and your triceps were really important, and, and when I'm doing my jump, jump roping, that would really um, work those muscles. Mm-hmm. Um, so I did a whole lot of that. I, one of my trainers here locally, um, Sammy Sanders, was um, an ex-military guy. And I think he was in the special forces, so he he knew uh, about physical performance, and he he was an, an amateur bodybuilder, so he taught me about uh, isolating muscle groups and like we do chest and tries one day and, and legs one day and back and buys one day, so we would hammer those muscles uh, to to failure, uh, but he taught me about uh, the proper form so that I would never hurt myself in the gym. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we do a lot of repetitions, and my form would just be perfect. Like, I would never swing the weight. You know, I'd force myself to suffer as I'm going through each rep. Uh, so just little things like that. I, I think I was the first person to, to take all that stuff really seriously. Um, cardio, uh, muscle, uh, working those muscles. Um, and I also rode a lot. Yeah. You know, I rode my bike a lot. I, w- I would get a lot of riding in before I would even go to the gym. Um, I had a job at uh, U.S. Air, so I ride my bicycle to work. I lived in Petersburg. <laughs> the airport far. was in Hebron, and uh, it was dark. You know, I'd get up, I don't know, 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning, and uh, uh, nobody knew I was out there. I didn't have light on my bike. You know? Oh, my just, God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I only had so much time in the day. Yeah. You know, my job was providing some money. I had to squeeze in the fitness, and um, I I wanted it I wanted it bad. Yeah, that's that's wild. But yeah, like that's that's the drive you had to have. Like you're gonna be like, well, get off at five. I can probably work out till nine or uh, you know you had to do you had to make your time management was very big key. Yeah, yeah, and, and the other thing was, uh, uh, it was fun. You know, like we were addicted to performance Mm -hmm. uh we loved the game we loved the the challenge you know like uh uh, it it was just as much about uh meeting our own personal goals you know just trying to be better than we were the week before Mm -hmm. um and the the full the fulfillment that you got from that you know so it it was never like a job It, it was always just like a passion you know like we were so driven um, uh, just because of this personal thing. Um, so cool, you know, that, that you could live a life where you're, you're motivated and you're fulfilled and um, uh, it's exciting. Um, it, it took me all over the world. All right. I got to travel and, and see so much, so much beauty, you know, like... Uh, uh, Idaho and Colorado and uh, Finland and Australia and uh, the That's middle the middle of Mexico racing the Baja 1,000 three times 
Like, uh, who, who would have thought that uh, some, some little punk from northern Kentucky <laughs> would, would be blessed with so much opportunity, yeah. such, a, such an exciting life? Was there um, a place that you'd gone to that you're like, we should move, we should move here? Or was it always, did you always want to come back to Kentucky? I, I guess um, I, this is my home because uh, this is where my family is. Mm-hmm. And, and this property uh, that, that we own in, in Petersburg is, is so beautiful. It's, it's one of those places where you go and you can just sit down and you can just look around and, and take it all in. And it's, uh, it's special. Like you feel rejuvenated. Uh, just listening to the birds and, and watching the sunrise mm-hmm. and uh, seeing the trees and, and uh, it's a special place. So I, I've always uh, uh, been excited to, to come home. Um, and, and I've seen, you know, I've never been to Hawaii, but but I've been to a lot of cool places. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's another thing that that to me drives home the fact that there is a God. Yeah. It is that the beauty around the world is overwhelming. Right. It, it ain't no accident. I know. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Uh, I think about that sometimes, like when I travel for work, I'm just like, man, sometimes you, for, you forget about all these great places when you just kind of don't leave your area a little bit. And no offense, people just don't want to leave. But when you venture out, you're like, this is amazing. Yeah. Yeah, uh, people are amazing. You know, mm-hmm. the world is amazing. Uh, everybody has uh, their own story. Every, yeah. Everybody has something very valuable to contribute at all times, every day. Yeah, people, people are cool. You know. Yeah, I think if I don't watch the news, I think I think it will make you give you a lot of negative mindset but i think in general if you just kind of like don't watch that and you just go somewhere and just kind of like wherever it is people are more or less people are nice like you're gonna find more nice people probably than hateful people yeah regardless of what you see on tv like um i've i was in san francisco last fall and people like oh you're gonna go there i was like yeah i'll check it out and i just kind of was like i want to go where's a good place to eat this and that and i i travel by myself and I didn't go to the inner city where all where it's you know all bums. I just kind of stayed around the edge, of the, of the by the water and the wharf. And I was like, that was, a, I had a really good time. And I think that's probably all the majority of the world in a sense. Yeah, <clears throat> you know, I, I went through this thing a, a, a few years back where I I had some negative experiences with people. Mm-hmm. You know, like uh, people were being shysters. Mm-hmm. Like let's say an auto mechanic type place, yeah, trying to sell me parts that my car didn't need, yeah, because that's where the profit was. And if I was no more the wiser, um, sure, uh, mm-hmm. he's gonna he's gonna pull one over on me. Anyway, I had several of those type of things happen right in a row, and it, it took me to kind of a dark place. And uh, it's around Christmas time, and and, and I kind of said a prayer. I was like. All right, God, if you're real, uh, please make your presence known and explain to me why why there is evil in the world. You know, what's up with these people mm-hmm. that, are, that are pulling this stuff on me, and, and why does it keep happening? And, and uh, sometime during that night or early that next morning, I, I felt this joy that I can't describe, mm-hmm. but it was as if... You imagine every person on the planet smiling and the joy that it took to make that smile. And you put all that joy from all those people in me in that moment. It absolutely was mind-blowing, the, the happiness that I experienced the night that I said this prayer. Well, that, that answered my question. But as this happened to me, this voice said, Scott, we're all just supposed to love each other. Mm-hmm. And I thought to myself, <laughs> all right, I get it. Thank you. Thank you for giving me this feeling that I've never felt before in my life. Uh, now I know you're real. And now I know what we're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. 
and and uh, my brother-in-law had given me some really good advice uh, back during this time. He said, Scott, he said, if you look for evil in the world, you'll find it. Mm-hmm. But he said, if you look for good in the world, you'll find that too. Uh, he said, it's all about what you want to look for. Yeah. Well, uh, I had this experience, and now I just look for the good. You know, I, I, I refuse to let my mind uh, to occupy any of my time thinking about the bad. Yeah. Uh, and gosh, have I been happy. And, and they talk about this in the Bible. Like, you, you experience uh, the peace um, uh, that's just beyond measure. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's kind of where I am, man. I'm, a, I'm excited to be alive. I, I see the magic every day. Um, you know, you, uh, and some people may think I'm crazy or I'm a kook or um, I'm delusional. But there's this, this uh, song that, that you sing when you're in church. Uh, it's something like, uh, uh, and he walks, he talks with me and he walks with me. And um, uh, he tells me I am his own. Mm-hmm. I believe in that. You know, yeah. like uh, I believe that if you do the same thing I did, if you just say, hey, God, I don't know if you're real or not. Uh, If you are, just make your presence known. I 100 percent believe that you will have an experience that's out of this world. Uh, If you can just have enough faith to to ask, ask that question. Yeah. And, And I know I'm not alone. There's people all over the world that did what I did that night. And, and that's why there's little churches all over the planet right. because these people know um, there's something magical to life, you know? Yeah. And, and there's people worshiping this this magical, wonderful force. Now, I used to think about that a lot. You know, racing all these different places. And there was always a church within a couple of miles of no matter where I was. Right. There's a reason for that. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of people that have a story to tell very similar to mine. Oh, 100%. Like, I used to, uh, I was as I was listening, like, I used to find myself get jealous of people, things they did or things they had. And then I realized, like, like I don't know, not even that long ago that, it, like, I'm kind of, I, I like where I'm at. And just because someone has something or it goes on somewhere across the world or does something i don't you know, like it it's just i'm always like oh do you have a good time or that's pretty sweet and then like i just move on and realized like my life is what i want to do and stuff like that like like this house being you know, remodeled it's i enjoy it it's mine and yes i miss out on some like other things on the weekends but i'm enjoying what i'm doing and i'm i'm i wake up every day like oh let's get back to it what i got to do next type thing or I was excited that you came on today. I was actually a little bit anxious, a little bit, but uh, just stuff like that. Like, I'm enjoying things a lot more. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah, I mean, um, I think all of us would would do uh, uh, our ourselves a great service by by just smelling the roses. Yeah, and, and put a little more thought into every experience that you have mm-hmm. because. Um, I totally believe that it's a big puzzle and, and the pieces are being placed for us magically at all times. You know, it's like uh, we're learning lessons we're supposed to learn. Like you said, people are coming into our path yeah, uh, just just the way they're supposed to. Right. You know, and, and, and there's a magical ending uh, for all of us. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of. I'm kind of blown away that yeah. that's the way the world works. Yeah, it's it just takes. Um, I remember my buddy who was uh, who I'm friend. You know, he was always a church guy, and he's like, "Man, you just gotta pray." I'm just like, I just blow it off. Yeah, what? Okay, man, I'm sure. I, I don't really, I don't know. And he's like, "No," and like, he's just like, "You just gotta pray and everything." I'm talking like years to me. Just tell me. I was like, All right. and then finally, I was just like, "I'll give this a shot." And then, uh, me personally, I'm not, um, for, for personal reasons, I'm not a big church, going to churches person. So I'll go with my family sometimes, but I enjoy by my bedside every night t- saying what's on my mind. And I feel like that works for me. 
Right. I'm right there with you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm right there with you. I, I, I'm not a big church person. Uh, not that I don't uh, haven't enjoyed going. Mm-hmm. You know, my grandparents uh, went to church a lot when I was a kid, and I, I, I tagged along with them. But um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm more about the personal relationship, and um, uh, I say prayers. Yeah. And, and I'm grateful. Man, yeah. I'm so grateful every day. Yeah. Man, I find so much uh, to be grateful for. Man, my body works. Yeah. You know, everything about my body works. I don't have anything that, that hurts. Um, I've broken a lot of bones in my life. Uh, I've never broken my neck, knock on wood. I never broke my back. But I broke about everything else. Like my orthopedic file is um, <laughs> is really thick. Yeah. I've had a lot of x-rays, um, had a lot of casts. So I feel so blessed that... Um, Man, I wake up in the morning and I feel great, and I love physical work, and um, uh, that's that's a blessing. Like my body went through some some pretty bizarre stuff, you know, to be uh, exposed to all the rocks and roots and mud and um, sand and and uh, the speeds and the dust, you know, like where mm-hmm. you can't see but you're going really fast. Uh, yeah, the, the risks that I that I took, uh, uh, I'm, I'm fortunate. Well, the infamous XR600 where you're holding it up picture, like that kind of blew up, you know. And did you realize how much, I guess, fame or how much attraction that would pull when you did that? No, not at all. Um, uh, we were cleaning the shop one day. And there was a bike that had no forks and no shock on it. Mm -hmm. And I needed to move it out of the middle of the floor because I was mopping the floor. So I just reached under it, picked it up, and carried it over and put it on the bike stand. Well, Fred or or one of the other guys was like, that's pretty cool. You think you can do that with the rest of the parts on it? And I was like, well, I I think so because that wasn't that hard, you know. So uh, (laughs) they rolled a bike out there, and and, uh, I did it. And uh, they were like, man, we're going to take some pictures. That's cool. And um, so it, it was me mopping the floor that, that kind of started that whole thing. Yeah. And uh, Tim Tolleson worked for Dirt Bike Magazine. And I was a contributor back then. I had some articles, uh, how-to stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, Tim was like, he was at the farm one day. And he's like, man, that's cool. And uh, he, he did probably the one that got the most attention. And it ended up on the cover. And then it was in uh, Cycle World, like a the centerfold thing of cycle world and um it, it it turned in to be a great marketing thing for my sponsors yeah for you know? sure i mean i know honda and pirelli and oakley and all those companies just loved all that exposure um that that little silly thing uh created because it, it kind of snowballed right right um you started seeing and then everywhere i went to every event uh people were like we know that's not real scott yeah so you know, put your money where your mouth is. Let's see it. So then I started having to do it all the time. <laughs> you know, it was like just part of my weekly thing. Yeah. Um, because my ego wouldn't let me not do it, you know. Because right. I had to prove those people wrong that I could actually do it. And, uh, I mean, if you think about it, um, it was only 300 pounds. And, and guys that deadlift weights, yeah, they're doing way more than that. Uh I think a lot of people just never really put that much thought into the fact that it's not that much weight. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's it, it's kind of awkward because you don't have a barbell to grab a hold of. But I had little tricks. Mm-hmm. Um, I grab a hold of the header pipe under on this side and then uh, the muffler around the frame on that side. So I had a good firm hold of it. The funny part was uh, one day I was up at the Six Days of Michigan and uh, this young girl was riding uh, like an XR 400. Uh, and somebody uh, said, well, I bet you can't pick it up with her on it. <laughs> and me having the ego that I had, you know, I was like, well, I think I can. And uh, so I picked up a full-grown woman on an XR400, and that was heavy. Yeah. Like, that was just about my max. I should have never even tried it because I could have hurt myself. Yeah. It, looking back, I was like, that was pretty stupid, Scott. Yeah. You know, you could have... Uh, <laughs> had a terrible physical injury you know plus dropped some girl and hurt her you know Mm -hmm. it's like that was probably one of the dumbest things i've ever done but because i had such a big ego 
uh, uh, wasn't about to back down from a challenge, you know. Yeah. I'm older and wiser now, you know, <laughs> yeah. but some of the silly, stupid things that I did. Did you ever, uh, um, Caleb Russell wanted to break your record. Did he ever reach out to you about that or ever talk to you? Um, <clears throat> when Caleb broke my record, yeah. um, I went to that race okay. to congratulate him. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we had a nice little chat. Yeah. And he was cool. And, and I was like, you know what? You've, uh, you have the c- capability of, of annihilating this record. You're right. he was still young. Yeah. He did it. I was like, you could win twice as many races as I won, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, he was he was humble about it. He's like, well, don't put that kind of pressure on me. <laughs> yeah. You know? He could e- I, I know he could easily got 10. Yeah, yeah. He was just so good. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, Caleb started – uh, in the youth classes, mm-hmm. you know, so um, he was developing skills at a way younger age than I was. You know, I, I yeah. wasn't figuring it out until I was probably in my twenties, and um, he was he was doing GNCCs, you know, in the same courses, you know, that right. were teaching him. So, yeah, he he had opportunity. His dad was Jeff Russell, mm-hmm. you know. Jeff and I were buddies, and uh, Jeff was smart and talented, so. He, he, he grew up in an environment, kind of like I did, that was just rich for, um, for knowledge. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So, so uh, do nowadays bikes have changed a little bit? KTM has kind of become the, I don't know, the poster child of off-road bikes. Have you ridden one of those in, in, the, in the recent years? Have, and if so, what's it feel like? No, I, I haven't really ridden one in recent times. Uh, uh, the last time I rode a KTM would have been back in the, the 90s, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, uh, so, I mean, I respect what they've done. Right. You know, they, they have single-handedly uh, dominated uh, the space. I'm sure uh, the other manufacturers are are, are kind of bummed. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, there was a time where KTM was was a pretty small fraction of, of the bikes mm-hmm. that were out there, and boy has that changed. I know. Yeah, they they've really uh, they they've made some good decisions. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, they've uh, man, they yeah they've like I couldn't say corner, but for a minute they had the whole outdoor like off road market. To some like everyone went in was KTM one way or another. Yeah. It's like dang, where's everybody else? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. Um, I got to spend uh, quite a bit of time in Japan and, and with some of the engineers <clears throat> at Honda. And um, it, it's, it's, it was fascinating to kind of get into the mindset uh, of those guys that make the decisions. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, there's a lot of pride involved. Um, and, of course, sales reflect... Um, uh, how many decisions go into the manufacturing of a motorcycle? It's a lot. Yeah. And um, there's a lot of pride involved in being involved in that process, and, and the sales numbers kind of reflect how successful you are at that game ultimately. Mm-hmm. So um, it's got to be frustrating for for a lot of the competitors right now. Yeah. Um, that that they're not getting to experience uh, maybe that pride that they once had when when um when their bikes were at the top um yeah it's 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 interesting after you kind of you know hung it up where was honda in the off-road did they kind of did it kind of just go down a little bit well when i retired uh from from doing the racing myself i ran a race team for a couple years okay where i had a a couple younger guys that i was helping out uh, Paul Wibley from New Zealand yeah. was one of those guys. And, and uh, when he left me, he went to Randy Hawkins' program at Yamaha mm-hmm. and became a GNCC champion. Yeah, uh, I think a couple of different years, I think. So um, uh, I think if, if uh, uh, you know, the economy kind of made a turn in 2008. Right. So a lot of the sponsorship dollars dried up. Um, so it, it became more difficult for me to, um, to stay in it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if things had been a little bit different, uh, I think that uh, I would have won a championship with Paul. 
Yeah. You know, uh, he, he rode. We had Honda support and Parts Unlimited support uh, for a couple of years before I retired. Uh, but, you know, I wasn't really completely happy in that role. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and probably wasn't even that good at it. Running a race team is a lot different than twisting the throttle yourself. Right, yeah. So uh, I probably um, uh, grew into a position of incompetence. You know, like mm-hmm. I probably never even belonged in that position. Um, uh, uh, but it was it was still fun, you know, and I, I learned some stuff. And it really gave me a lot of respect for... Um, for the guys like uh, Roger DeCoster, mm-hmm. you know, who who are, are kind of like these kingmakers, you know, right. it's like they they see uh, potential in young riders, and they have a, a vast amount of knowledge about performance parts and what works for who, and and even putting the right people together, you know, that's important. Right. Uh, there's all these personalities and egos and. Uh, that can get complicated, and, and I probably wasn't the best with that, right? Because I was kind of a hard ass. You know, I was old school, and I wanted to see my guys suffering um, as much as I suffered. I wanted them to want it as bad as I did, and when I didn't see that, um, it was hard for me. I bet. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, it was hard for me, and and, and I probably wasn't good at it. You know. I, yeah. Uh, I probably didn't handle things the way I should have. Uh, my approach probably should have been more compassionate mm-hmm. and, and um, more flexible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you still ride today? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't ride a whole lot, but when I do, I really enjoy it. Yeah. You know, I, I, I don't uh, go fast. <laughs> uh, I like to do what I, what I call motorized hiking. Okay. Like, I like difficult trails, um, and, and I like just um uh just cruising mm-hmm. you know I, I don't feel like i have anything to prove uh i don't want to hurt myself i don't i don't want to push myself and put myself in harm's way yeah um but i still get a kick out of uh controlling that power um controlling that bike and and just being out in the woods yeah you know? like i like i like looking around and seeing what's in the woods and I mean, I, I can have just as much fun clearing trail as I can riding my bike because it just it's an excuse to be in the woods. Yeah. I was going to ask you about that. So you live on a nice piece of property, and we talked about nutrition. Did you ever, like, consider hunting to get your food? <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I believe that. Uh, yeah, I, I believe in that. That's that's probably a very good source yeah. of nutrition. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, a lot of people are like, oh, deer is gross or you're killing animals. You you people need to go to, like, a slaughterhouse or something. And then, then come talk to me. Right. <laughs> a- absolutely. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, my, wife and ha- my wife and I have chickens. Yeah. And um, we have a well down in Petersburg. And uh, I-, I only drink well water. Oh. I, don't, I don't drink bottled water. I don't drink tap water. Okay. And I don't even let my chickens drink tap water. <laughs> they drink well water, just like I do. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, um, if I'm going to eat these eggs, I don't want them consuming the stuff that's in tap water mm-hmm. because that's going to find its way into my belly, you know? So I'm, I'm kind of fanatical and, and, and a little bit nuts when it what? comes to some of this stuff. <laughs> no, nah, you're good. I, I never thought, what's why, do you, why well water versus <clears throat> anything else? Well, it, it's coming right from the earth. Right. You know, and, and I figure, hey, um, God made it. Yeah. So uh, um, I, I kind of do that little, I ask myself that question every time I, I, I take my fingers and head towards my mouth. I'm like, okay, did man make this or did God make this? And uh, if man made it, I try to lay it back on the table. Yeah. Um, and, and, I, and that goes all the way to, like, um, white bread. Yeah. Uh, uh, I prayed for Chipotle for years. <laughs> I, I, I said, God, please create a fast food, health food source. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, we were traveling all over the country. And it was hard to find good food, you know. Uh, and, and when I retired, sure enough, Chipotle <laughs> came about. And uh, I was so happy. Yeah. 
Chipotle, you need breakfast, like a breakfast burrito. <laughs> like they need to get on that like now. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, that's something I'm kind of passionate about. I, uh, you can probably tell just by talking to me that, that uh, I've become kind of a freak about, yeah. about f- fuel. Food is fuel. Sugar is poison. Yeah. You know, love your body. Love yourself. I'm uh it's funny in the winter time there's nothing else to do so I'll work out twice a day or something just whatever just I know I got to get through winter in the summer I, most people you know they try to say summer body I fall off the rails due to I love like a nice like uh, well I got my nephews who are a drumstick ice cream I, I could eat those every day yeah I know they're terrible for you <laughs> or uh, occasionally uh, I don't drink too much more like I'll have like maybe if I a mountain bike ride I might have one afterwards but the summertime, I'm it's I'm opposite of most people. Most people do winter weight. I feel like I can manage that better than summer. It, it just destroys me. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, I got no problem with rewarding yourself. Yeah. You know, I mean, heck, uh, my wife and I have talked about this, and, and we've been doing the keto thing. Yeah. For um, almost a year, uh, I've lost about twenty pounds. Okay. She's lost a little over fifty pounds. Wow. And um, gosh. Uh, I feel great, mm-hmm. and and I know she's feeling much better too. Um, so uh, it was really amazing when we first started doing this. How many different places sugar sneaks in? Yeah, you know it's in things that you wouldn't think it's in. Mm-hmm. Um, it's in ketchup. All right. You know, um, uh, it, it's it's just everywhere. This high fructose corn syrup is is everywhere and um it's it's not easy i mean no. it's, it's a challenge and, I, and i'm lucky because my wife stays at home and uh like i said she's a caregiver so um we go to the grocery and, and she creates these wonderful keto meals but you know we don't have spaghetti and meatballs anymore mm-hmm. we have meatballs yeah you know uh i grew up on uh kind of potatoes and and all these starchy carb midwest carb based foods yeah. yeah and uh we just um we we just stopped yeah you know like uh since i retired from motorcycles um i got married um i started a relationship with god i stopped my relationship with sugar and um i'm happier than ever been in my whole life that's uh, awesome yeah i mean uh um it's it's been a wonderful wonderful experience have you ever heard of a it's called the, uh like the carnivore diet so it's yep. super high protein and um some people live by it and i i believe in it like uh just high protein diets like i, I was watching this one guy who said the whole um like this guy's like hey if you want protein even if you want to like lose weight build weight muscle some people think just take a protein shake a day and you're good which is complete, I don't know, false. He's like, if you want to be um, 180 pounds and you want to sustain that, you need to take one gram of protein per pound. So, like, you want to take in that that amount per day. Or if you want to lose weight, take in, you want to go down to 160, take in 160 grams or something like that. And uh, I thought that was pretty interesting. And people doing the uh, carnivore diet, they said they can, their joint, older people, their joints feel better and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it falls right in line with my formula, you know. Yeah. Um, did, did God make it or did man make it? Right. You know, God made that squirrel. Yeah. God made that deer. Yeah. God made that cow. Um, so uh, I'm down with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you want to tell me what you have coming up at the farm? Uh, I'll try to get this little beat out this week, this week, before this week. Uh, what do you have this weekend? Well, um a friend of mine uh, that used to work with me at, at Summers Racing Components mm-hmm. uh, contacted me and he said, hey, Scott, I'm involved in a, a trials club and we want to know if you'd like to have a trials event on your property. And, and I said, that sounds pretty cool. You know, I've always thought that my property uh, kind of lend itself to um uh, trials riding. There's mm-hmm. a lot of rocks and roots and steep stuff, um, off cambers. You know, is, is a lot of variety, uh, and, and just difficult obstacles. And 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 I said, well, that sounds pretty cool. And uh, so, 
this weekend, um, uh, Trials Incorporated is having one of their trials events uh, on our farm. Okay. Um, uh, let's see. It's going to be uh, starts at 10:30. Uh, the youth classes start at 10:30, and then the adults start at 12. Okay. Um, and then they start earlier on Sunday. It's like uh, 8:30 youth on Sunday and uh, 10 o'clock adults on Sunday. Okay. So Sunday. Uh, where, where can people go to find more information? Uh, if you go to trialsinc.org, okay. uh, they have the schedule and all the details. Um, it's going to be pretty low profile, like there's not going to be food trucks and that kind of thing. Right. Um, and it's going to be hot this weekend. Yeah. So uh, if you're not into being outside in August in Kentucky, you might not <laughs> want to come. Uh, but it's a beautiful piece of property, and if you're into motorcycles and you like to watch uh, people challenge themselves yeah. in a beautiful place, uh, come on down. It's uh, 10 bucks is the gate fee, and it's also $10 if you want to camp. Um, my place, our place, is right on Wolper Creek, which is a beautiful little valley. Yeah. Um, and, and like I said before, it, it's just a pretty place to, to take it all in. And there'll be um, different level riders, like amateurs, all the way up to experts. And um, I'm anxious to be a spectator myself because yeah. I have a lot of respect for uh, the skills that these guys have. And, and it's pretty neat because it's, such, it's so different from the sport I was involved in because you can own a trials bike and, and set up some concrete blocks and a couple logs out in your yard in a very small place. Yeah. And, and really challenge yourself and develop your skills. So it's it's almost like a, a game um, of um, personal uh, achievement, you know. Like most of these guys aren't really competing against the other guys in their class. They're competing against the terrain right. and themselves. They're just trying to do better than they did in the past. Yeah. And it's, it's fun. And, and what a great group group of guys you know they they don't have big egos they, they don't uh, they're happy for everybody you know they're not just happy for themselves uh, they cheer for each other um, and, and they study these obstacles and they, they think their way through it and and it's I mean I've seen some of this stuff on TV that'll blow your mind it's yeah. like how do some of these guys even come up with the idea that they might succeed? At some of these obstacles. Yeah, I know. Yet they must have that idea because they actually do it, you know? Right. Um, and, and sometimes you, you can watch something and not even believe it with your own eyes. And, and I guess because of my background, I kind of know um, uh, what, it's nece- what, what it takes to put a motorcycle through certain obstacles. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, I get my mind blown. You know, right? And those guys just asked me if I wanted to compete in the event, and and at first I was like, yeah, I think I'd like to try this, <laughs> because one of the guys offered to loan me a bike. Yeah. And uh, but then a few days later, I started thinking about it, and I was like, well, why do I want to test myself at something? Why do I want to test my skills at something that I have no skills at? Yeah. You know, so. Um, there would definitely be a, a big learning curve. <laughs> yeah. You know, like they have tools in their toolbox that I never possessed. Um, right. Um, but there were people in in my sport that had trials experience, uh, like David Knight and mm-hmm. Shane Watts. Right. Uh, that went on to become some of the best riders in the world. Yeah. And I feel like it was because they had that trials experience uh, that guys like me never had. Yeah. So when they're approaching a log they could unweight the bike or do something special and just pull these little tricks out of their hat that of course I couldn't do. Right. Um, yeah. Night, man, that guy, that guy's unbelievable. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, but yeah, some trials stuff I see, I'm just like, it's insane. Some of the stuff they do insane. Yeah. It's it, like I said, even, even when you see it with your own eyes, y- yeah. y- your brain still can't, uh, can't accept what, what, what you just saw. Right. Um, like, almost like a magic trick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Scott, thank you for the time, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, man, we, we talked for a while, and uh, I'm glad you came on. And 
Uh, hopefully you come back sometime. Well, uh, if, if you'd have me, it'd be my pleasure. Yeah. I mean, these walls are blank, so, if, you know, if you ever want to give a jersey up or anything, I'm down for it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so, once again, thanks for coming on, and uh, I hope we, uh, everything goes well this weekend for you. Thank you. Good luck to you. Appreciate right. it. Thank you.